Uh, it's, it's been a very important subject, I think, artificial intelligence. Europe has just kind of let go, in my opinion, and given up leadership to China and America, as well as other Asian countries. So we should really wake up, and I'm going to the next commission has a very strong program of, of investment in education, investment in, in this field, uh, will be very important, in my opinion. <laughs> Last December, last December, I was EPP, Opinion Chair of the Total and Comprehensive European Industrial Policy for AI and Robotics. It was the first official EP position on AI technology. During the negotiation process, all of us agreed that the human-centric approach is crucial when talking about AI and robotics. Our decision makers do to ensure that the technology and its development is safe, that accountability is clear, the choices are not biased, and that humans understand how decisions are made by their machines. The, the ethical aspects of AI and robotics should take into consideration the union's existing legal framework. Values and fundamental rights, in particular when it comes to privacy, dignity, consumer protection, and non-discrimination. <coughs> it's crucial that the new technologies of AI would not be used for malicious purposes. It is important in these talks to have a close cooperation between industry, academia, and the public, so that the fear is minimized. Because we do feel there's quite a bit of uh, a bit of fear. So because I'm not feeling well, I've got 39 temperature, uh, I fear I need to lower my down a bit today. So excuse myself and uh, and hand over for, for the the remainder of the session. I'm very glad that we have the minister from Lithuania, who's very progressive, and that's that's tremendous. And I hope that the little countries like Finland, which is much bigger than Lithuania, right? uh, but especially Lithuania, Estonia, and, and Latvia, those countries can can really try and invest in this area, which which would create a lot of well-paid jobs. And I really feel that we should we should uh, we should definitely not give up and keep keep going. And I hope the next commission will be very very motivated. We also have Mr. Carl Christian Burr, Deputy Head of Cabinet of the Commissioner Gab Gabriel, as well as, as the Minister, which I already mentioned. So thank you very much for, for coming over. So I will allow Mr. Burr to have his word first and hand over this, this meeting for further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you will feel well uh, very soon. Um, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an overview of where we are right now. Uh, the deputy was referring to the next commission, which is, of course, coming up after the next parliament is being elected. And so we have all faces all around, new faces. And, of course, we were still here right now trying to shape a bit what's happening in the future. And so the, the status quo, what has happened over the last year, and also the preparation of the next funding program, which is starting in 2021, so very early in the new... Um, in the new legislature uh, um, period uh, is important and will prefigure a bit what will happen and what's possible to happen uh, on an on a, uh, artificial intelligence. So just to recall uh, that we have been discussing this topic for uh, a good 16, 18 months right now and uh, it's almost a year ago that uh, the Commission tabled the, the EU strategy uh, on artificial intelligence and uh, this is based on, uh, in fact, uh, the insight that this is a technology that will uh, develop further and that will have an impact not just for the IT sector or the supply side, so, you know, have another company somewhere in the world, maybe in Europe, maybe elsewhere, that's one aspect to it and it gets a lot of attention, uh, you know, which is understandable, but much more importantly, this is a technology that has a potential impact across the whole economy in all sectors of the economy because all industries, all companies are using digital tools they all generate uh, electronic uh, data streams. They all have the opportunity to optimize their processes, to learn from the data, to improve their own decision making based on the data. That's what we're talking about here. And the question then is, what should public policy do to accelerate this development, uh, to enable this development, maybe to prevent it from being stopped uh, prematurely, uh, and also for uh, uh, pointing uh, young people people who look at different careers uh, into the direction that would enable them to, to thrive in this area. So in a nutshell, you already have, uh, in what I just said, uh, the basis, uh, the basics of what we put forward in the strategy last year. There's three parts. We want to increase uh, the investment uh, to bring Europe up to the level where it should be uh, compared to its size and, its, um, and the value of, the, of, the, of its economy. 
it's too little. We have statistics that show that uh, investments in Asia and the US are three to five times higher nowadays. Mostly that comes from the private sector. Uh, but also, um, uh, still today, as we are speaking, uh, even the public sector investments uh, there are larger than they are in Europe. But that doesn't have to be like that, and the factor is not that large. And this is why we have done what we could do, namely to ratchet up the uh, EU investments uh, in the current year, so 2018, 19, and 20, uh, by, by 70% to 1.5 billion euros just from the EU budget, which, uh, just to remind you, is about 10% uh, of public research and innovation funding in the EU. The other 90% come from member states and uh, regional uh, levels. So there's a lot that uh, has, has a knockout effect and follows afterwards, and of course needs to also increase its efforts to, to increase the overall EU investment. We have formulated a goal um, that is to reach 20 billion euros of investment all, uh, all together, public and private sector, per year. Uh, we haven't really said which year should show this, this uh, goal to be reached. We always said during the next decade, so sometime between 2021 and 2025, 2026, I would say, is the moment when this number should be reached and, and then quickly surpassed. And of course, what uh, what is required to get there is that companies actually do invest, and then this becomes a self perpetuating uh, investment <coughs> loop, of course. You invest in something which is then working, increases the business, grows the business, and so on and so on. Uh, just to be sure, um, investment not only doesn't only mean that you produce new products that you then sell in this area, it also means that you invest in the technology, that you operate your own business using this technology. So we're talking really about the whole economy here, we're talking about productivity. Uh, if you're a company that uh, avails itself of new tools and you gain 2-3% productivity per year and your competitors don't, uh, very soon they will be, fall far, will be falling far behind. So this is, this is the important part here. Uh, this is the uh, um, second part of our strategy, which is about uh, ensuring that companies can actually uh, uh, make use of this uh, new technology. One important thing is skills. Uh, you need to be able to draw on people who understand this. Uh, who can use it. You also need to be able to draw on tools that uh, can directly help you in um, using AI technologies without hiring uh, an expert, because for now there are not so many experts around. That's likely to stay the case even for a few years, because the growth is so strong that even people coming into this sector uh, will be uh, quickly snapped up by, by companies. So there is then the question, I mean, do you really need uh, uh, you know, a motor engineer get a car, no you don't because there are companies that produce this kind of thing. We are still in a phase uh, in which AI and AI technology is, is um, uh, growing, so it's not that mature yet that you can just go to a shop or to a service and buy it. So you need to first understand what you can use there. And uh, we have therefore also invested in projects that will help uh, uh, companies to make this step, that will give them advice. I just mentioned a digital innovation which we have for 700 million euros uh, for the next uh, financing period. And the point of that really is to have a place in every region in the union uh, where com companies can go and can get the, um, uh, the, the skills and the know-how and the advice that they need to, uh, to get started. So that's the second part of our strategy. And the third part is about the legal framework and the ethical framework. Uh, the legal framework was already mentioned. We have already have, uh, of course, a strong legal framework in the union in general. We have a strong safety uh, framework. We have vertical frameworks in several areas. Uh, just to mention the, the car security field. I mean, this is something that uh, has a very long tradition. It's a strong vertical regulation, but it just concerns those kind of products, cars, streets, traffic. Okay? So if you talk about AI, you have transversal technology. So there is always a tension between, okay, do we go vertical, do we do go horizontal, when do we go where? And so that's why we have spent a lot of time uh, looking at the current situation, analyzing it, also um, uh, different parts of it. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned already safety, there's the security side of it. Uh, we did a lot in the area of cybersecurity, and there's an interesting overlap between cybersecurity and AI, because you can use it both to combat cyber threats, but also to uh, perpetrate uh, cyber attacks. So, uh, there's a whole interesting subfield there as well. Um, and then, of course, we have other uh, very well-known uh, legal uh, frameworks like the one for data protection, which already has uh, quite interesting rules that pertain to, to AI as well. For example, there is a rule uh, that means that people cannot be subject to automated decision-making if it has an important uh, impact on, on their lives. Basically, I'm, of course, paraphrasing the, the regulation here. Um, which is very relevant if you think about automation and automated decision making, which is what we're talking about when we talk uh, about AI. So you have these, these parts, but it's not a coherent whole yet, nor do we think it will be 
you know, it's not just that you make a new regulation, you write AI on it, and then you have solved all the problems. It's not that easy because the application and the rules and the challenges are different in different sectors. We think about the health sector, for example, it's very different than from the logistics sector. In the health sector, we talk about better diagnosis, we talk about decision making, what kind of medicine should be given to a patient. So we talk about people, we talk about their lives, we talk about real impact there. We talk about logistics, you talk about efficiency gains, you talk about you know saving fuel, delivering products faster, but you don't talk about people's lives. So it's clearly that uh, clearly the difference between the kinds of situations uh, we're having here. And that brings me to the uh, to the big thing that is uh, coming up actually next week. So that's why this discussion is quite topical. Um, as you might know, the Commission uh, charged a high-level uh, expert group last year to work on, on this topic of AI ethics. And so this is the ethics of developing and using AI. So it's not just uh, you know, what, what are the rights and rules for people who are exposed to a system, to an automated decision-making system, but it's also about, okay, what should we take into account when we build one in the first place? Uh, should there be requirements? Should there be approaches? Should there be uh, guidelines, help, uh, helpful advice to, uh, to companies engaging in this? And the group has been working away since last June on this. They published the first draft of their uh, advice in uh, December. We had a public consultation uh, lasting until February. Uh, which produced a lot of uh, a lot of answers, uh, about 600 pages of PDFs that have been published. If, you, if you're interested in uh, looking at that, very interesting academic debates in there, but also very practical ones. Because of course, uh, you know, ethics is a bit, it's a big topic. Philosophers have been on it for you know well nigh 3,000 years. So we, we don't, we're not going to fix it in nine months. That's very clear. So you can also have you know terminological debates. Uh, you know what, what is the approach? What, how we should we uh, first even discuss this? What are the terms? What are the words? Um, and clearly, there is not uh, you know, one, one true and many false solutions to this. That's, that's very clear. But as soon as we come to closer to the application and to the practicalities, uh, we have a lot of convergence uh, there in the, in the discussion. Because, of course, if you want to have a practical impact, you need to lift this debate. It cannot be an academic, philosophical debate. It needs to be very practical. It needs to be usable for companies, uh, if not for, for the actual developers uh, who, who set up these systems or for those that uh, architecture them and manage them uh, going forward. And this is why the group has not only put forward what the fundamental principles and requirements uh, they think ethical AI should have and show, uh, but also uh, very practical, um, uh, they call it like assessment lists, uh, so really practical uh, lists of questions, uh, uh, things to check, approaches, what to do first, what to do next, uh, to see how to, how to approach this uh, when developing AI technologies. And uh, this is on the table now. Uh, or will be on the table actually, it's on our table, not on yours yet, it will be published on Monday, uh, and then you can have a look at it, and we're going to launch um, uh, a phase of, of uh, making it uh, practically usable, of applying it, of uh, learning uh, whether it is fit for purpose yet, and uh, then, we already talked about the next commission, um, we will probably, unfortunately, from my personal perspective, uh, will have reached uh, you know, the calendar uh, the, the heart, uh, heartbreak uh, in November uh, when, when the new college comes in uh, and they will have to decide well, how to take this forward uh, afterwards. That's, that's in a nutshell uh, the situation which we are. At the same time, we've of course continued the implementation of the AI strategy uh, with member states actually. It's quite a novel approach. Uh, once we tabled the uh, strategy in April, we discussed with member states immediately uh, with all of them. Uh, and we came to a joint uh, action plan, the so-called coordinated plan, which was published in uh, December. And the whole point of that is not just to repeat the, that these things are important and we should take action very soon, but also to start doing things right now, even though much of the funding and much of the new investments will only come on stream in 2021, because we know that the next EU budget starts in 2021, and uh, this is the money we are right now discussing also in this house, here in the Parliament, at the Council, uh, to make sure that we have enough budget for these uh, new important investment uh, areas. Uh, and member states and the Commission have agreed uh, on actions that are, should be taken right now to be prepared and really start on the 1st of January 2021 uh, with the new uh, actions. Just to give you an example, uh, we will fund the, the, the digital innovation hubs I already mentioned, but also uh, excellence centers for AI. Um, just two examples. The question is, of course, what kind of excellence centers do we already have? Where are they? Uh, what are the member states' uh, approaches to this? How do they want to concentrate uh, their resources? Do they want to have one national center, for example? Do they want to have a decentralized strategy? All of that uh, requires preparation, because otherwise you cannot be there on the first day uh, to, to apply uh, for this funding that would be available. And so this is a, an example of, of actions that are being taken right now. Uh, a second one, and I wanna, uh, I'm going to stop with that, is the whole area of data. Um, of 
of course, we, for us, it's a separate policy area, data protection, but also the data economy, and, uh, data sharing, making it simpler and easier and faster to share data, making it more secure. Uh, there's intellectual property uh, questions around the data as well. We just uh, uh, renewed the, uh, the, the Open Data Directive. It will be voted, I think, today uh, in the Parliament, actually. Uh, and will come into force and make more publicly funded data available for the general economy. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this field, which is, of course, directly relevant uh, for the development of AI as well, because uh, without data, there's not a lot that it can chew on. Uh, you need it, to, depending on your technology, you need to train the AI or you just need it to, I mean, to be the material that, uh, that the AI algorithms are working with. So there's a lot in this data field as well. Uh, in, in which the Commission and uh, the member states agreed uh, on, on taking actions. There's funding, I mentioned that earlier, 500 million a year from the Commission uh, for mm -hmm. projects in this field, uh, which are already ongoing right now. And so it's a safe bet to say that uh, AI will continue to be an important topic also into the next mandate, uh, certainly of the, of the Commission, I'm sure, also of the Parliament, uh, to, to make sure that this is not a one off. Uh, so, this investment is not just discuss once and then you put it there for autopilot. No, we need to review the plan with member states every year to discuss it and see uh, where we get with it uh, to, to adapt uh, to, the, to the new needs. And I, I, for one, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually get earlier to the 20 billion investment per year uh, because this is a dynamic, pro uh, dynamic process and it's, uh, you know, it's not just everybody looking to Brussels for investments. No, everybody is asking themselves this question right now, all the member states, all the companies. Uh, and the numbers are quite encouraging. Uh, so I think if we meet again in three, four years, uh, we'll see much different uh, statistics already. So I'm going to stop here. I'm very interested to hear from, from the Minister, how it looks from the perspective of the Member State. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will now take over this all male panel and try to do my best as a female moderator. So could I invite the rest of the panelists, the rest of the men to join me, please? <laughs> I have to say that. So we have um, our Minister of, um, you have a very broad, um, it's innovation and technology and economy. Um, and as our MEP unfortunately had to step down, so you would simply have to carry the burden of the government here. Um, we decided that we would go directly to the debate, but you would start the debate and I would um, actually want to ask you um, that simply as this morning we will have to fix the situation between government and artificial intelligence. Um, so how can you make AI work with, it, with the governments and with the people? Um, we know that we should see this technology as bringing new opportunities for social construction, uh, to improve view in policy making, yet there is a growing anxiety among the people about the ethics and the moral and anxiety that will the machines take over my job, will this algorithm tell me how to vote, will you fake news it and, and, and take away my social security So, Where are we? Is it a threat or an opportunity and what have you found in place? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, great start uh, by the um, first, first of all, such approach from Brussels, knowing uh, where we are, because from the member state uh, position, you don't really see all all what's going on really here, and, and always trying to, first of all, create something on your own. So Lithuania, kicked off with the, one of the first uh, artificial intelligence strategies and why uh, we decided that it's important, first of all because of the reasons you have mentioned. Uh, and uh, one of the key things is the lack of knowledge in society of really what it is and what opportunities it gives. Uh, from a small member state perspective, it's an opportunity window and it's very important to to mark that um, me as a politician, I might like it, I might not, I might understand it, I might not, but it's inevitable and it's going to happen. And it's extremely important to start dealing with it as soon as possible. First of all, for politicians, understanding how it works and what challenges it brings. Secondly, of course, uh, enlightening and helping society to uh, 
find out what it is, really, what opportunities it gives, and of course, create uh, create uh, those, I think, uh, life-changing solutions. So from the Lithuanian perspective, of course, we approach by, first of all, uh, our first approach is open data culture. And uh, as it was mentioned before, without uh, data, there can be no uh, artificial intelligence solution. And we can see uh, being in European positions, uh, it's clear that we are slightly behind, behind the Asia, behind the United States, but I wouldn't say that we already lost the race. We can see there are good and bad practices, and we can see the China approach, which is, uh, uh, which is probably different than, than what we, we, we look at here in Europe. Uh, First of all, of course, we want to tackle those ethical issues uh, about first, uh, data, getting data, approaching it, working with data. So it's very important that with that uh, uh, boost of open data culture, we wouldn't forget uh, those legal and ethical questions. Second, of course, extremely important is educational skills. And again, here we can mention the China as, uh, as one of the Examples were in schools, they already start teaching what is artificial intelligence. Not many countries in EU member states do have that. Uh, some are trying to, uh, to get in uh, by the universities, by the universities programs, and that's already a, a step forward. But uh, education and skills are crucial and extremely important. And the third, what is the key, and where we again a, are very conservative here in Europe is, of course, approach to capital. In order to develop artificial intelligence uh, solutions and products, one of the key things, of course, is the access to capital. Unfortunately, here we lose the United States. I wouldn't say that the public goods, if you look at the United States, uh, artificial intelligence strategy that uh, the public money are allocated. Uh, you can find some uh, larger allocation in their military spendings, uh, but in general, artificial intelligence doesn't have uh, uh, doesn't have any any place in in, in, the, in the public budgets. But uh, private are much larger than here in Europe. China, it's slightly opposite. The public spendings are, are large. Uh, money spent for for companies to develop their products are increasing. And here in Europe, we do have a great homework to do. But this is, again, a good time to discuss it because we're talking about 2021 uh, starting European Union budget, where we can uh, put a focus on things which are important, which can make Europe, I think, a superpower in artificial intelligence and solutions which are concerned against to them. Uh, so the most important thing for politicians to understand that uh, you might know what it is, a big data, blockchain, artificial intelligence, you might not understand it, but it's inevitable and it's going to happen. So it's better to start talking now, uh, finding solutions, which will definitely be going to open a large window, an opportunity window for all of us and our society. Thank you, Minister, for the great opening. Um, I will then move uh, to the European Commission. Um, we have here Mr. Eric Badiquet, advisor for artificial intelligence. It's amazing that the Commission has a function for artificial intelligence, and that's, uh, that you're, you're doing well in that department. But are we really doing well in the department if we compare ourselves with the US and China, like you mentioned? This past month, uh, Trump's White House released executive order of maintaining American leadership in artificial intelligence. We know that the Chinese are tackling a lot of issues with the Asian population, with the environmental issues. Like you said, they're educating already school children. Other Europeans, are we lacking behind, even though you have fantastic in <coughs> ideas that you have proposed us, and we know next week more. But where are we with this? Could you give the genesis of the European AI to us in five minutes, please? 
Okay. <coughs> well, thank you. <coughs> it's uh, good morning. Uh, of course, it's uh, it's a bit difficult given that the crowd question. I already said everything, <coughs> but uh, I, I think I would uh, second the, the minister's optimism. Yes, we are. Uh, of course, we have a very big competition out there, uh, as we know. As Carl said, uh, three, five times more investment in China and in the U.S. Uh, the GAFAs, of course, they are. I mean, the you know the big, the big uh, companies, the big data companies, the big uh, digital media companies in the U.S. Have, <clears throat> are sitting on a huge pile of, of data, and this is actually one reason why AI is, is exploding now, because all this data is available. I mean, there are other reasons, of course. Uh, we have more computing powers. We've made some breakthroughs in some of the algorithm, but this this data, uh, this personal data is playing, of course, a, a very big role in the, in the rise of, of AI. Now, one way to look at this is that this was the first round. So, yes, we are not doing so well in this area, but we can still catch up, but maybe the second round will be the vertical data, the verticals, uh, the, the, all the sector data, and there I think we have, uh, uh, we, are, we are very well positioned in Europe. Uh, we have, uh, for example, a health, a health system that is, uh, that is uh, you know, more class, uh, it's, it, it's relatively uh, easy to imagine that we could, if we want, we could pull all this data together. This is one of the, uh, the line of action that we have in the Commission. Uh, in other areas as well, I think if we talk about, uh, about mobility, about uh, autonomous car, we have very, very strong assets there, and there are many others. So <clears throat> I think we, uh, we should not uh, just say, you know, we've lost it. And this is the reason why we, we came out last year with this, uh, with this um, strategy. I, I think that we maybe we are a bit guilty recently to put a bit too much emphasis on the, uh, if I may, on the, on the softer -ish aspects, which are extremely important, of course, uh, the ethical uh, work and the work of our high level group. Uh, uh, this is the way to start. But in giving more visibility to this, we have lost a bit of visibility on, on the purpose, on the overall purpose of this strategy, which is before everything an innovation strategy, a competitiveness strategy, when we say we need more investment, we need to work with member states, and this is, uh, Carl already mentioned this, we, we have a process now in place to align uh, AI strategies in Europe, so I think we can see there were some uh, pr first movers. Uh, Lithuania, for example, others. Now we see that a lot of member states, probably because we also try to organize this, are, are, are waking up and are coming up with an AI strategy. So if we align all this, if we invest more, if we get to the 20 billion uh, uh, as soon as possible, and, and even to more in investment, I think we can we can make a difference. Um, so I'm, I'm not, maybe we can come back to, I'm not going to monopolize the discussion, but we can come back with more details on, uh, on the different parts of the strategy uh, at another point. Yeah, that's a good uh, way forward. And there's a lot of questions that are popping into your mind, and I'd like to open later also to the floor, so if I keep them down or let them to your iPad or something, we'll get back to them. And we have this fantastic duo from the Nordic rock. So, um, I'm sorry for my fellow Finn, but I have to go first to the Norwegian part because we're sort of like doing this horizontally still. Um, so we have Trund Helge Borsen. I try to sort of make all these, um, yeah, good. Uh, you're the council of the IC policies and, and government administration, and, and Norway, as we all know, is one of the digital champions. Um, so please tell us what have you done already and what are the tricky points that we have been discussing a little bit. Maybe you could elaborate also the willingness of the talent to go working for the government and also the, is there an appetite actually from the people to be part of this process? Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you very much for being invited here uh, today. Uh, I mean, um, first of all, I think I just want to say that uh, that uh, as uh, uh, a member of the EA and with our uh, European Economic uh, Area Agreement, uh, we are very much aligned with the EU policies uh, and, and we very much work towards realizing the digital single market uh, in Europe. Um, and also we have signed up to the 
to the coordinated action plan on, on AI and uh, we really see the, the, the value of pooling uh, resources, I mean in terms of research and uh, uh, investment testing facilities in these areas because uh, obviously as a small open economy uh, we really see the value of pooling together here, we are not big enough uh, on our own to succeed uh, in this field. And um, looking it, at it from a Norwegian perspective, I think I really want to start talking about uh, trust, perhaps, because uh, I think really trust is perhaps one of our uh, biggest uh, assets uh, in Norway. Um, I remember close to where I grew up, there used to be this uh, sales uh, men uh, during the summer who put out their cherries uh, on a table along the road, and everyone would just leave the money there and then take the cherries and and although today we, we use the mobile phone to do the payments actually, so it's developed a bit this, this as well, but I mean it shows really the level of trust um, I think in the society and it's not only trust uh, towards new technologies but also towards uh, the government and, and government services. And, and I think this has given us a very important uh, head start, uh, if I may, because um, we do have uh, registers, we have, uh, we have a lot of data whether we look at the whether we look at the health uh, records or the tax systems or or, or whatever and, and and these are the areas where also with artificial intelligence we have started to, to experiment uh, I mean for instance in with our labor and welfare uh, authority uh, they are doing a lot of tests they've established their own AI lab uh, where they are trying to test out predictive analysis, for instance, trying to find out what sort of jobs people who have been long-term unemployed should be looking for, uh, what are the success rates and how, how can they be matched with the, with the jobs that uh, exist there. Um, and also in the, in the tax area, we have done quite a lot of work actually uh, to try and pick out, for instance, the, the tax declarations that should be looked at more carefully uh, by humans, whether they are likely to be false or, 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 or potential uh, fraud. But, but there are also, I think, an important, some important findings have come up, for instance, and this is, again, the things uh, which are important when we talk about AI. It's, it's not only trust, it's the transparency. It's because we also, in Norway, have a strong focus uh, that people should know uh, who have access to their data and how uh, the data is, is treated. And it was quite interesting, actually, with the example from the, from the, uh, from the, um, the tax uh, sector where it showed, for instance, to begin with, they had to rely on, I think it was around 500 uh, variables to make this detection of these suspicious tax declarations, or whatever you want to call them. But in the end, actually, it's, it was discovered that with around 30 variables, you could make just as accurate mm -hmm. uh, predictions. So there's also something about the amount of data you actually need. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a bit important in this discussion as well, that you not focus on technology as such, but the purpose you want to achieve and what you actually need to, to do to achieve that purpose. So that's a few words to start the discussion. Thank you. And then um, Janne Beltola, you work at the permanent representation, but you have been involved also in the AI strategy, I believe, before in Finland. At least you know something that is be fantastic if you could share it. We know it's one of the big things on the Finnish presidency if we have a government and if the elections go away. <laughs> but anyways, could you please give us a short introduction? Yeah, thank you for your kind presentation and uh, good morning to everyone and thank you for having me here. I mean, we will have government, we will have a caretaker government at least, so no worries with that and besides of the government we have a very good civil servants working here, so no problem with the presidency. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, uh, about the Finnish AI strategy, I mean, uh, it was, the work was started already in May 2017, and it was initiated by our Minister of Economic Affairs, Mika Lintila. And actually before that, I think it was our Finnish Prime Minister, Juha Sipila, who made the, uh, the work to have the AI mentioned for the first time in the European Council conclusions. So I guess that was what was what was paving the way for the Finnish work as well. Uh, so in uh, 
in October 2018, we had the first kind of like a midterm preview of our strategy, which was actually among the first European national AI strategies. And then the final report was published actually a couple of weeks ago in March. And uh, there were, of course, several key recommendations, uh, which, uh, uh, which all actually touched upon these issues, which we have, which we have been mentioning here. So um, I would say nothing new to anyone on, in this room. I mean, we have to clarify the rules of the use of data. We have to support uh, the development of the test, test beds, test environments, and regulatory sandboxes. We have to ensure the ability for major investments on AI and the RDI, uh, RDI uh, pro uh, projects. We have to create an uh, extensive offering of online, uh, online courses for everyone. And of course, we have to ensure a human-centered introduction of AI and the uh, deployment of ethical practices, just to name a few of those. So, but what happens now after the strategy has published? I mean, we have election coming, and so of course it's the new government who takes the next uh, next decision on what uh, on what steps we will uh, go ahead. But I mean, I can relate a lot what was said by the Lithuanian minister and. Uh, my Norwegian colleague here about being a small country. So actually the way we work with this AI strategy was of course pooling our all resources together. So the <coughs> strategy was compiled in a way that it was a network of networks. So there was kind of like a steering unit and then we had uh, four or five different subgroups on special teams. And there were really all the AI experts from Finland were gathered together to work on this, from private and public sector. So, but why do we work on this? Of course, like the Lithuanian minister said as well, that AI is coming. We want it or not, but we have to know what's going on there, and we want to be in the, for, uh, in the among the forerunners who want to take use of this uh, opportunity which AI is giving. And I would, of course, I would like to, uh, to also uh, to be on the same note as uh, Mr. Padike from the Commission that we have been concentrating a lot on the software issues, which is, we won't deny it. It's, it is important to uh, concentrate on ethical issues, but it is about innovation and EU to be competitive on these AI issues as well. This is that AI will, for Finland, AI is the new electricity. That's that's how we treat it. It's something that is going to change the world and the industry and everything. So we have to be, we have to know what's going on there. We have to be competitive there. It will have a, a crucial uh, effects on our competitiveness of our industries and companies of all sizes, as well as of the society as a whole, of course. So that's why the so-called software issues are important. Thank you. Let's continue a little bit about the, maybe you call them still soft issues, but I think they are the core of technology, which is the fairness. Because we talk about algorithms, you can't do anything without them. So how on earth will you build a policy that has embedded fairness Regard, treating everybody equally, um, regardless their education, sex, traditional distinguish that we usually do, or human face will do in a social context uh, for the social benefits and stuff like that. Is that part of your DNA? Is that part of your work? Um, maybe we will start for my fellow Finn there and <laughs> come back. Thanks. Uh, I guess you are trying to put the question here. Is it going to be like a technocracy versus democracy issue? I told you that yesterday. Yes, <laughs> and now you took my shine away that I was trying to be a voice by you. But yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, like every new technology, uptaking a new technology, what you need is trust. 
and how to create trust among the uh, consumers or the um, citizens of EU or of the whole globe. I mean, you have to educate the people, know what the AI is about. And actually in Finland we had this, the Russian national target to educate one person of the whole population of Finland about the basic elements of AI. And we had this uh, massive online, open online course called Elements of AI, which was totally free and it, it is, it's totally free for everyone, it's even in English, and now it's even in Swedish. Uh, it will be translated into other languages as well. So it was created by University of Helsinki and a company called Reactor, which is an ICT service expert company. And it's uh, for now, I think there is like 100,000 people from Finland have taken the course. So we are already past one, uh, one person. We are in almost two persons, the first person here. So I would say that education is the key to create trust there. You still didn't mention anything about handling the algorithm, but maybe the Norwegian colleague can go into that. You have a trust uh, society, like you said, um, but how do you tackle this issue of, of sort of equal, that everybody should be equal in front of an algorithm, which could be very racist actually, or particularly in some sort of places. So do you, is this an issue that you actually are thinking about? Yeah, perhaps I should have said that to start with. I mean, we are still working on our national AI strategy, which will be published later uh, this year. But uh, but uh, I, the, the things, the skills part is definitely very important. I, I completely agree with that. We have done the same thing as in in Finland, but we have also tried to create kind of uh, low barrier, uh, entry barrier arenas, if you want to. Like we've used our public libraries a lot to, 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 to educate, to give courses. Uh, to boost the digital skills, for instance. I think that's an important element to it as well. You have to make it easy for people to engage uh, with these uh, issues. As regards the, the algorithms, um, obviously, I mean, since, since uh, the very beginning in Norway, it's been part of the digital strategy that, that you as citizens, you should be aware of the data you give, who has access to it, and, and, and how it's treated. It's very kind of integrated the digital services uh, that the government has, has rolled out. But, but clearly we see that there are issues here. Uh, there are also very important ethical issues uh, as well related to the, to the ownership and, and the management of these uh, data. It's, it's, it's not only knowing uh, the, the algorithms, it's also knowing uh, the data sets and, and who else has access to those uh, data sets because uh, I mean, uh, if the data are limited in some way, the solutions can also be very, uh, very wrong. So I would say we have a, a strong focus on this, but perhaps not any more concrete answers at the moment. Than that. And of course, teasing, we, we, all, we all know that we're sort of making this di digital democracy as, as we speak, that those are the issues that come to my mind as, as a citizen. Uh, what about the commission, soft values for investments? Now you have made your ethical guidelines, we'll hear next week more about those. Yes, uh, maybe the word soft was not uh, the best choice uh, when I spoke first. Uh, maybe these are the really hard issues, but uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we, we need to find a better way. But uh, maybe I can just give a, a bit of a, a, a preview of what will come out next week. Actually, all of these things have been discussed already for months. We've already published uh, a preliminary draft of these guidelines, but yes, fairness, trust is absolutely essential. So that's why we will have one uh, one of the categories of uh, you know these, these guidelines and, uh, and these principles uh, addressing diversity, non-discrimination, of course. And there we are talking about uh, being very careful about biases that you may have in data sets. So there is a whole uh, there is a whole notion of, of having data sets that are, that are high quality, that you cannot tamper with, that are protected, etc. So a lot of work there. Uh, diverse design teams, so uh, some recommendations, and also in the 
in this uh, checklist or assessment list that Carl mentioned, which is the practical part of, of these uh, guidelines, uh, there will be questions to companies that want to uh, introduce some uh, products and services that use AI. Have you made sure that you have uh, diverse uh, teams, that all, all, the, uh, all the different uh, shades uh, are represented so that uh, your algorithm is not only is not only programmed by, say, uh, white male nerds, but also, uh, you know, you have other type of, all the views that, that have been in included there. And then, of course, there is the whole, uh, the whole idea of uh, stakeholder participation. Uh, we have uh, an extensive uh, uh, program now to, uh, to bring these, uh, these draft guidelines to, uh, to, to a broader set of, uh, of actors. Uh, through the platform, the AI Alliance platform, where we have about 3,000 people now uh, contributing. We will also organize, to be confirmed, that probably end of June, an event, a uh, physical event, where we'll bring people around this. And we are, of course, looking at ways, or starting to think at ways to make this sustainable, because uh, also, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we don't want to have uh, something that is uh, fit for all, uh, uh, one, one, one solution for all. There are very different requirements in the different application areas, and we we need to be uh, to make sure that all these principles are actually living principles can evolve. So we need to have a kind of a sustainable way. I don't know if it can be a foundation. There can be some kind of other construct that will make sure that all these principles are reviewed regularly and, and benefit from further discussion. Other, maybe just very quickly, uh, uh, guidelines or recommendations that are important that the high level group will come out with is transparency, so which is related to trust, of course, uh, the trustability of AI systems, explainability. Of course, we know that the black box uh, issue for AI is a big issue. Uh, you, you have to make sure that these AI capabilities are communicated, that the uh, user knows that he's actually talking to an AI agent and not to, to a human, that's, that's very important. Accountability, of course, auditability, all these things are very important as well. And, uh, of, of course, the other side, so uh, the, the, the possibility to say, uh, I stop here, I have a red button, uh, this thing is not going to take control. So I think all these are contribute to, to trust and fairness. And we have to go to the hard call with the minister because we were talking about uh, public funding. You actually sit in a position where you can have a direct impact. So what, what is your government doing to have more public funding on AI? Okay, so I will approach slightly the question you had asked before and then finish with the, with the, with the public funding. So to begin with, uh, uh, of course, it's extremely important, and probably if we talk not only about the artificial intelligence, and about digitalization in general, about the poor industry revolution, it's like a weightlifting, and you have to lift with the both hands. So on one hand, you have the policies which must be suitable for business, so no gray zones left, because that's probably the worst what the politicians can do, leave the gray zones where the business don't know how to approach, how to operate. Because uh, the bad policy or the good policies, the business will adopt, uh, adjust. But if there is a gray zone where you don't know what to do and you know uh, you can be illegal the other day, the business might choose uh, another location to, to work. But on the other hand, you have, again, that uh, human-centric approach which you need in all this uh, um, in all this era we're living, uh, we're, we are living at the moment. And um, I wouldn't say that in Europe this is a problem because um, those past three years, starting with the European uh, Parliament Commission, uh, together with the member state countries, we actually kicked off with that human-centric approach where we're discussing putting a large focus on uh, First of all, on privacy policies, on, on, on a human kind approach, but of course, uh, there are uh, always a, a government going to drive their feet behind. Extremely important to, to be flexible, to look at those uh, uh, strategies, uh, policies, 
uh, from time to time and adjust them to uh, real world needs. Um, from what you have asked about the possible approach with the with the um, racist abuses or or or, or uh, sexist abuses and, and so on uh, that exist and unfortunately exist in the world we're living at the moment and. Um, there is a great example of one state in the United States where the uh, artificial intelligence judge was created. So he was gathering the data from the judges. Uh, of course, all the laws were put in, uh, and idea is great. A, a perfect judge who, who knows how to adopt one or the other law. Unfortunately, most of his decisions uh, were taken on a very very racial approach, and it didn't work. But uh, everything can be improved, uh, first of all, starting from ourselves. So uh, it's very important to lift with the both hands and uh, uh, leaving no gray zones for businesses to develop, uh, for solutions to develop, and of course, not to forget that human-centric approach. Fortunately, I think Europe is leading in that human-centric approach, and with the discussions we have, it always gets a, 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 a very a great underline. Uh, speaking of access to capital, so here in Europe in general, we have a, a, a problem because uh, allocations from a national budget to artificial intelligence towards innovation is always hardly possible because in every and each member state, first of all, what you have is social issues which you need to solve. And social budget against the innovation budget is going to always lose that battle. And me as a minister, I can I have this every year. Um, but uh, fortunately to that, first of all, we have European Union uh, budget <coughs> where we can uh, approach those issues uh, different, uh, where we can specify the priorities where the Europe has to move. Because again, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, artificial intelligence cannot be developed by one by one in the countries. It has to be developed together in Europe. And especially speaking about the allocation of funding. And um, it's very important that uh, the um, way which Europe is choosing towards that 2021 budget approach would stay the same that artificial intelligence would have a, uh, a additional line where the funding is very clear towards the artificial intelligence, towards development of artificial intelligence. So what the government can do, first of all, is the, of course, uh, educational approach. Uh, putting it, because uh, we all spend um, uh, large sums of, of money and it's never enough for education. So it's very important that that education would be up to date and we wouldn't waste our resources and budgets on to, on to yesterday's education which unfortunately uh, uh, creates those social problems uh, rather than creates a tomorrow solution. And uh, another thing is of course it's very important to create a environment where the business would be so strong that it could uh, uh, you know, uh, fund R&D. And this is uh, probably one of the major challenges for a small countries like Lithuania, where the businesses are relatively still developing after uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and after the Soviet, Soviet Union fall, where you know, uh, private uh, uh, private businesses were some kind of evil at that time, so it's it's very hard that in 20 years and 28 years you would have such a strong companies would already have enough resources to allocate R&D and and so on. So it's very important for us to maintain those conditions to 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 make them 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 good for those companies grow. But of course, uh, small member states are always going to look at the uh, European Union where uh, together with the partners we can, we can uh, develop the solutions and have that access to capital, which is, which is very conservative in Europe in general. Thank you. Um, what I would like to hear now from um, Norway and Finland would be really concrete examples. What could you do? Would, it be, would AI be the tax expert when I call in and ask something? or? Could you give a few examples that you have found out what would actually be something that would really help me as a citizen of Finland or Norway? Um, 
Yeah, I think it's really important in one way that the that the investments and the services we develop that they give a clear value uh, add, so that we as citizens can really feel uh, that this is something useful for us. It makes everyday life uh, easier uh, in a way, and uh, and also an important principle for us uh, when developing the digital strategy is, is kind of that. Well, first of all, you as a citizen should not give, have to give more information than what is strictly necessary uh, to get the service. And secondly, uh, that's something you actually have a right uh, to receive, you should not have to ask for. Uh, I mean, to give a very concrete example, for instance, in Norway you have a right to have a kindergarten place for your, for your children. And uh, in the ideal situation, then, you should, as a parent, you should uh, at some point uh, receive uh, information from the from the government saying uh, this uh, are the kindergarten places available to you, which one uh, would you choose? Uh, and very simple, just reply uh, to this, having actually to do much yourself in terms of filling out forms and, and applications. I mean, we are not there uh, yet, but that's something we are we are working on. But I think uh, um, across a range of, of, um, of government services, we have uh, we have taken steps to make it easier for uh, for for citizens yeah, to, to to engage. And AI is crucial, uh, plays a crucial role in, in making those systems uh, working. I remember queuing two nights here in Brussels to get my <laughs> kindergarten I wanted, so I think you could scale it up and, and bring it up down here. Um, <laughs> Janne, do you have a concrete uh, example to share? Actually, I do. <laughs> uh, but first, I would like to touch upon a couple of points that Minister now will try to introduce mentioned there that uh, about uh, investment level which which a small country can uh, can achieve I mean and even EU compared to Asia Asia or Asian countries or US uh, I mean of course we are we are a small country as well and we acknowledge that we can never achieve the level of the investments as some other some other countries but we need to build on the strengths that we have in a small country. And we have to really pool the resources, uh, both public and private sector investments are needed. And uh, I mean, although uh, an investment is a small one, it, it can be a very crucial one if it's uh, very strategically aligned. But uh, then about, uh, about uh, the EU's position in uh, global AI landscape, I mean, we will have 28 or 27 national AI strategies and by middle of this year by, or by the end of this year. Uh, it's actually, it, it is actually not a good, a bad, I, bad idea or bad thing because then we have 28 different cases where we can learn from each other. And we can also learn from we can learn the good practices, what we have been doing in different member states, and most importantly, we have to work from the things that didn't work. We have to share those issues as well. But going to the concrete example, which Madam Moderator was asking for, uh, <laughs> as a Finnish citizens, there is good news for you. I mean, very happy we have this. Uh, a project called Aurora in public sector, which is kind of like a, some boring and some very traditional again, but it's kind of like an AI chatbot, which will help you in different life situations. For example, if you are moving from Helsinki from the capital of Finland to Turku, another city in the west coast of Finland, you can uh, check with the Aurora AI chatbot uh, what was I supposed to do again when I'm moving, what kind of things I have to take into account. So you don't even have to queue in on the phone or if at least not go to physically to anywhere. You can just ask the board and it, uh, Aurora and it will guide you to the right places and give you suggestions what you can also do. Helpful? Super helpful. Usually they don't understand my questions though. Interesting, but that's probably a problem. Would the Commission like to wrap up before maybe I can still open the floor? I'm looking at the end. Or maybe the next moderator, if you allow us five minutes to open to the floor. Thank you. So, 
Thank you. Well, I think uh, yeah, very interesting uh, examples. But maybe I, I could I could also comment on, on on your question because I know that you you are interested uh, in particular in this area, public services. They are for public services. I think there really the sky is the limit because uh, there are so many uh, opportunities to do things in a better way if you uh, if you are smarter about using data, collecting data, and, and uh, making data, taking putting together the right tools. So I think maybe this could have been an introductory remark, but uh, you know, there's a lot of hype about AI. But AI, in a way, is just the next step in the digitization of the, of the society, of the industry, and of the public services. So I think in terms of uh, where, where is AI useful for public services, uh, front office, we, we just heard about chatbots, etc. I think it, it, it is essential, it's going to reduce the waiting time, it's going to, to make uh, the interaction between citizens and all the public services much more efficient, uh, chatbots and, and other new interfaces. The back office, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities there for autom automization, uh, robots, software robots, but maybe other types of robots as well in order to, uh, to be more efficient, also to reduce backlogs, because in, in many administrations there are huge backlogs, uh, to also shift the, 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 the added value for the human uh, higher up, so, so that the humans uh, are you know, spared of uh, routine tasks, etc. Et so there is a lot of potential there. And the third area, of course, is intelligence in order to design policies uh, that could be uh, analyzing uh, huge data sets to, uh, we had some examples, Axis, for example, but they are, I mean, they as well, a uh, huge number of examples, or also uh, real IoT uh, strategies, real-time collection of data in order to optimize services, whether in transport, whether in lighting in cities, or all sorts of, I mean, everything can be improved if you're smarter about, uh, about data. Uh, so I think there are, uh, in a way, there's huge. There is a huge potential there, and that's what we are trying as part of our strategy to uh, to, to promote. So we can see uh, big uh, big wins on the public side. We can see big wins, of course, on the industrial side, with the sharing of data, with the SMEs also being smarter about their uh, the relations with their customers, uh, the, uh, about their supply chain, etc. So. Uh, I think I would share the minister's optimism. Uh, you know, we are we have uh, great opportunities and great assets in Europe. So just let's just make it happen. Fantastic. And now, anybody from the floor, would you want to have a question? Please identify yourselves and please. I don't have a phone, but a microphone, but I will. Is it okay like this, or I will? Yeah. yeah? Um, just from a simple citizen uh, perspective, I wonder for the example of um, artificial intelligence for kindergarten or the chatbot for uh, Finland, what are the actual challenges for the government? Because I think it's, it, it sounds to me like it's not difficult to send an email to all the citizens who, are, who have newborn children and later on to sort of... Um, put them in places, or for the chat box in the case of Finland, I would say that all this information about the move is probably available on the website. So what are the, what are the actual challenges for the government? Because it looks like we are so much lagging behind, all, it looks like the technology is there, but maybe I'm wrong. So I'm, I'm just curious, what are the actual challenges? Thank you. Thank you for the question, I think. What our experience shows in one way is that uh, up until a certain stage, I mean, the fact that we have had very good registry uh, data, for instance, has helped us uh, a lot, like uh, each of the different sectors have I been, mean, one way, taken charge and, and made sure that they are kind of, uh, that they order in their own house, if you want to, and, and, and have the data in a, in a good uh, format and, and, and high quality data. But then when you, of course, get one step further and, and, and you see the AI, revolution in one way if you want to. I mean, the, the, the need to, to extract data from different uh, data sets across uh, different sectors, this is, this is a, a huge challenge. I mean, you, 
you often run into the problem that the, the different sectors come in the way uh, of each other uh, a little bit. Uh, so this is something you, you, you have to work with, I think, very, very, very carefully. And it's, uh, and it's tricky, for instance. I think I saw something, it's another example, if you want to establish a, a restaurant in Oslo or in, in Bergen, uh, I mean, you need, uh, you need 26 different uh, forms to do that. And it takes a very long uh, time. And there are uh, numerous authorities that are involved in, in this process so to, to make that automatic, to have some to, to, to make it more efficient for the citizen. It, it's, it's a lot of hard work and it's nitty gritty detail to then pull all the different parts of the problem together. Yeah, thank you for the question also. I mean, of course, my example was a very simple one. And uh, Aurora chatbot, it's a first step for the government. And as um, Mr. Padike from the Commission said, I mean, the, for the public sector, of course, the sky is the limit. About Aurora, of course, you can find all the details from the different websites, you can Google it, but that's what uh, our government or the, uh, has decided to do as a first step. But I can also mention two other concrete examples of how the public sector is using AI. In southwestern archipelago, we have ferries going from island to island, and there we have actually the first autonomous ferry going. Uh, so there is, there's, okay, there's a captain and there's a crew on the board, but the ferry is, uh, well, it's not driving, but it's going with sailing by itself. There is uh, AI uh, uh, leading its way. And then we have uh, actually something compared to the Norwegian Tax Authority. Our financial authority has also made an AI for uh, sorry, I don't remember it correctly, uh, completely, but something about following different bank uh, transfer actions and some sh uh, making uh, the AI start checking if there is some something su suspicious going on. So maybe that's more complex for AI, what you were looking for. And now we move on to the business side. Victoria and your team, please. Thank you so much. Have a warm Moderator Kaiser. Um, my name is Victoria Main. I'm CEO with Comrade Associates, a Brussels based advocacy and communications consultancy. I have the pleasure of moderating this panel on IA privacy concerns from a business perspective. So, we're going to look, um, as you know, much is said about the threat that AI poses to privacy. There's a lot of distrust out there in the 50 minutes that we have, less than 50 minutes that we have ahead of us. 
We're going to focus on how valid these concerns are, if they're considered valid by our esteemed panelists, what in concrete terms can be done about these concerns. We've heard earlier about the need for trust, the need for education, the need for an environment for business that is conducive to innovation while nonetheless protecting citizens' concerns. So our panelists are going to go into that. Many of them won't need any introduction to you, but nonetheless, I am going to do the honours. So we have um, Niels Hullen, who's worked in IBM's government and regulatory affairs team since 2015. His, his um, previous roles concern include heading Germany's digital association, Bitcom, in Brussels. We have Andre, whose last name, my Anglo-Saxon Kiwi tongue, is having trouble to get around, um, who's senior EU policy advisor and governmental affairs manager at Google before moving to Brussels five years ago. Andre was public policy manager in Bratislava at Google as well. We have Quang Min Le Pechero, who's new in town, um, Director, EU Government Affairs for Microsoft. Before moving to Brussels, he was Government Affairs Manager for Microsoft France, based in Paris. Gordon Morrison is Director for EMA for Government Affairs at Splunk. He's worked in numerous management and technical roles in the UK tech industry, most recently as a Director at Tech UK. Last and far from least, Chana Bue oversees public policy activities of BSA, Software Alliance, you name the topic, Chana covers it, including AI. Mm. Before we launch into the conversation proper, which we hope to make as interactive as possible, each of our um, panelists is going to be very disciplined and give a three minute opening statement on how um, what their perspective is on privacy and AI and business and what um, can be done about it. They're going to save the detail for the discussion um, in proper. So I would propose starting with Niels um, from his point of view and then we move into Andre. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, I think clearly privacy is one very important cornerstone when you talk about AI, but there are certainly more. Uh, more to it, you can have a fully GDPR compliant system, um, but yet, if you don't understand it, you wouldn't use it. And that was the, the starting point uh, for our IBM trust and transparency uh, principles, which we started to develop already like, one and a half years ago. And uh, we think that it must be clear that the purpose of, of using AI is to aug augment human intelligence, not to replace it. it sounds quite obvious, uh, but it's an important fact. And, you have to live it um, during the AI life cycle. Um, for us, it's another important um, aspect to make clear the data and the, the insights belong to our clients being a B2B company. Uh, and finally, um, explainability and transparency are, are key. So you should know when is AI used, which data are fed into the system, how are systems trained to come to a decision, um, and what has a company done to mitigate bias. Um, and all these high level principles are important to have, but it's even more important to put this principle into practice in the whole AI life cycle. And this is what we're really doing now uh, with different tools, with help for our software engineers, with policy work, um, with fact sheets. And uh, I would like to leave it with that and, and explain with the data what we're doing. Thank you very much. If we could move to Andre now for an opening statement, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we agree with the previous, uh, basically all previous speakers, that uh, AI brings uh, significant benefits to the society and, and to individual users. Uh, and also, in, in a similar spirit, as we heard from a colleague from IBM, we see AI complementing humans, uh, advising, uh, complementing. One uh, interesting uh, complementary advice could be, for example, that this panel is gender biased. Uh, and maybe an AI algorithm could recommend us to uh, invite some uh, AI scientists of a female. Um, uh, that would be amazing. Uh, one, and a half, uh, one year ago, we announced our AI principles, um, and one of the guiding seven of those seven guiding principles is respect for privacy. And 
And um, uh, it's not only about claiming certain principles, but how do you apply them? And so we have introduced the review structure, uh, a review process. And uh, there are different layers, you know, uh, education of the, uh, in taking the courses, uh, then flagging you as a, one of random Google engineers or employees if you see that something may be risky, and ending at a very senior level uh, advisory uh, debate and a decision. And one of those decisions that have been uh, taken is, for example, um, uh, Google's, Google not pursuing the face recognition capabilities as part of the cloud, exactly because of, of applying uh, the, the privacy concerns. The second point, uh, and I will have three points to, to raise in three minutes. The second point is um, uh, we have heard a lot about uh, trust. Uh, uh, and, and, and we see the debate moving maybe from this kind of very silver bullet solution algorithmic transparency more into, into the explainability and accountability. And, and we applaud that we, we agree with that perspective. Some of our guiding principles when thinking about privacy and how to apply it um, in our all uh, products and services uh, is uh, meaningful transparency, how to make it useful and understandable, and user in control of personal data. Uh, I'm a father of four children, so my privacy uh, setups usually tend to be very high, quite conservative. But then there are users who are so excited about the latest technological innovation that they prefer to have very tailored, very kind of uh, uh, personalized um, uh, solutions or recommendations, and I think both uh, should, uh, both of us, uh, uh, and, and a number of users in between should be given the opportunity. The last point um, uh, is that uh, sometimes we think about AI and technology as kind of counterbalancing the, the principle of privacy. Actually, our experience uh, talk of talking with our uh, engineers is that AI can enable innovation in privacy and data protection. And some concrete examples: one is a um, technological approach called a rapport. I will not, um, not uh, uh, you know, ask you to study the paper, but uh, the, the, the basically the, 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 the op this is a technological approach which we open source. It's available for all uh, stakeholders, and which allows large-scale data collection without with strong uh, privacy protection. So imagine that you have a chance to look at a forest while you are prevented to look at individual trees. And this is, again, a technological approach that allows you to study the forest, but protects the privacy of individual users or individual trees. Another one is uh, federated learning. Uh, it's, again, an engineering approach uh, uh, on device learning. So you have a, you have a phone. Um, anything uh, that, that you use on the phone is used to, uh, uh, to, to kind of the, for the algorithm to learn uh, and then sends a certain almost a statistical number or a statistical signal back to the cloud while all your personal data remains on your phone. And, uh, and zero-shot learning when there are examples of extremely rare cases uh, when we technically don't in have enough data. So this is maybe for the introduction. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Andre. Maybe we can go into a bit more detail um, following that before, beforehand, nonetheless. Um, Quang Min, if you could um, make an opening statement, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm much more aligned with all my colleagues around the table about uh, you know what AI has uh, benefits, and, but also the risks that we have to, to face. Um, I think privacy is, of course, really important because when it comes to artificial intelligence, it's more about data. And uh, we are lucky to have the GDPR here in Europe, which is great legislation. And uh, it is it's a great text because it's technologically neutral. And when you read the GDPR, you will not find the words intelligence because it's broader. You will see kind of automated processing uh, uh, definition, but not artificial intelligence. So that's, that's good. Uh, but maybe privacy is not enough, uh, and we should go beyond only privacy, because from a different extent, uh, uh, most of the AI systems are not running on personal data, but on non-personal data. And we all know that GDPR is all about personal data, so we need to go beyond. And my second point is, yeah, so that's why Microsoft, as my colleague from Google or IBM, we're trying to go beyond, and, and we build a set of principles to try to cover all the potential development risks and, and benefits of AI. 
And let me go very quickly through these this different principles. So, of course, one of them is privacy and security. Of course, we cannot avoid this one. Fairness. It has been mentioned a bit that fairness is very important. How can we make sure that our AI systems are not taking biased or discriminatory decisions? And that's a very complex challenge. There is no perfect solutions today, technologic solutions to fight against this discriminatory behavior of AI. Because discriminations and bias are coming, can come from the data we're using. It can also come from the system itself, how people have built the system. So that's very complex. Inclusiveness. Inclusiveness. We, as tech companies, have uh, the duty to make our uh, innovations, and AI in particular, available for everyone. And in particular, people suffering disease. So that's why we need to redevelop AI for, for accessibility. That's, that's a very important point. Reliability and safety. Uh, AI, we all know that have great potential, but can also harm people. And we need to make sure that uh, AI, when using in an unpredicted uh, circumstances, will not take unpredicted decisions that could potentially be dangerous or harm people. And the two last points, that the two last principles that are maybe the most important ones, transparency, that's been mentioned by, by Google, uh, uh, it's also a challenge, you know, because transparency is, is critical to build trust. If we don't have a transparent uh, uh, way of working AI, citizens and users will not trust it. But it's a challenge because AI technologies are complex and working on explainability of such technology is a challenge, but we're working hard. And last but not least, accountability. People that, who design AI systems must be accountable for the decision that the system would take. And computers must be also accountable for the decision that would be taken at the end. So that's, that's a very important point. And the, my last word is like, yeah, we have an internal committee called Ether for AI Ethics for Engineering and Research, made with senior people in, in, in our company, with lawyers, engineers, to try to implement these principles in all the stages of the life cycle of, of our AI systems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, kind of find an interesting perspective on going beyond privacy, which we'll come back to later. Meanwhile, Gordon, you're, and the work that you're doing at Splunk, you bring a, a bit of a different perspective, which would be interesting to hear about, and then go into more detail later. Thank you. Yes, first of all, first of all, first of all about Splunk, it's probably the biggest um, data, com data, a big data company you've ever heard of. What I'm going to talk about is how we think about ethics um, as a company. So my colleagues have talked about how we think about the technology, but how ethics are very important to um, go through your company and be, um, be part of everything you do. So beyond our core markets, um, Splunk is used to determine how many, you know, for all sorts of things, including we can detect how people are using washrooms, we can detect, we can detect electronic medical records, we can support the safe destruction of chemical weapons. We're also being used for things such as um, identifying students who are potentially struggling with their studies um, to enable early interventions. But a key point to you is really the sort of benefits of technology and what we're trying to protect. So one of the most moving uses of Splunk took place at a US college a number of years ago. A student posted a suicide message on social media and campus authorities were alerted because a college had implemented Splunk software to manage its Wi-Fi connection. Within minutes, the college was able to locate where the student has connected to a network and get him help. So we actually managed to help through an IT management solution to save a life. And this is what we're, we're talking about today, is how do we enable technology through privacy, ethics, um, through transparency, to ensure we can provide not just a, not just a service to, to corporations, but also look after, um, after human beings and our, our lives. Um, the other point for us, and most of my colleagues in the room here, is a big focus on um, corporate social responsibility, a thing called Sprung for Good. We help with things like the against human trafficking with the um, Human Emancipation Network. But my sort of last point is, and the point that's very important to all organisations that are in technology, is that all these programmes reflect our values as a company. So they not only produce tangible social good, but they also integrate fundamental respect for human dignity, diversity, and inclusion into everything we do. 
So what we're trying to do within the company is create a ethical flywheel that will unify and build trust amongst our employees, across geographies and cultures, and with our customers. And all that ends up in our technology. In most, most tech com companies, um, is ethical, focused on privacy, and aimed, aimed at um, doing the right thing for human beings. Thank you, Gordon. That's all very positive, and we might delve into into perhaps the, the areas where there may be risks and concerns. But meanwhile, um, Tomo, you have the um, benefit of, of coming last, so over to you before we open to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. I mean, the benefit of coming last, but also the disadvantage of being French. So being disciplined is not a thing I'm really good at. Um, so I'll try to keep it. You're sitting next to me. Yes, exactly. You can elbow me if I, if I go over. But I'll try to keep it relatively brief so we can have time for discussion. But, you know, BSA, we're a global trade association, and all members, many of, of which are on this panel today, are, have one commonality, is that they're mostly and primarily business to business companies. So when we look at artificial intelligence, when we look at technology, and Eric from the Commission mentioned in the panel before, AI is just the evolution of technology from what we've known it for the last 20, 25 years. Uh, so it's, not, it's not, nothing relatively new, but our companies really, their customers are ultimately us as end users, but they mostly have business customers or governments who seek to do things better, faster, more efficient, cheaper, uh, for the benefits of, of, you know, of, 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 uh, uh, of everyone and, and the community at large. Um, so when we're looking at, at, you know, at data, uh, data uses and privacy, I mean, obviously privacy for our companies dealing with data every single day is extremely important, something that we've been fighting for and pushing for for a long time in the U.S. way before there was even talks in Congress because we feel that this is an element of creating trust. I mean, we, we heard it many times in the last panel, in our panel. It's all about how do you create trust? How do you ensure that the, a company, a government, a citizen are going to be willing to put some data into a system to get a benefit out of it uh, without fear of, you know, getting, you know, uh, you know, losing it, getting it compromised, having negative decisions sticking about you or against you. So it's all about creating a trustworthy environment. Privacy is only one of these components. We heard this morning Carl uh, mentioning you know, cybersecurity uh, being a huge part of that. There's a lot of other components. We also at BSA, you know, we're not so revolutionary as everybody else. We also put out our five principles for responsible AI and trust by the AI. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to list. I mean, I'm going to list them, but I'm not going to go into details. If you want to have a look at them, you go to our website, bsa.org/ai. You'll find a whole bunch of documents where we explain what what they are. But our five principles for for uh, trust by the AI are fairness. Accuracy, data provenance, explainability, and responsibility or accountability, as, as Kwon Wim was mentioning a minute ago. From, from our perspective, when we look at, at AI systems and how they are deployed and used and how you can create this trust, you need to, you, you need to look at two things that are really critical, context and purpose. Because all AI systems are going to be able to, to sift through vast amounts of data or small amounts of data uh, in, in similar ways. But what you need to think about is what is the context that I'm using this for and what is the purpose? Because this will have radically different uh, 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 end uses and therefore you need to have to put the marker on protecting things more than others at every step of the way. So I, I will you know, leave it there and happy to, uh, to get into the discussion. Oh, that was pretty disciplined. Um, thank you, Toma. Um, maybe we could, if I'm hearing you correctly, when you talk about context and purpose, you're saying that there shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all approach to privacy and AI. Um, and I was wondering if you could elaborate, if I read you correctly, on that and whether or not, um, see in, in Europe we are pretty keen on, on privacy, um, whether or not you're seeing signs already of a threat to innovation by um, what some, um, particularly in business, may see as an overly zealous approach to privacy. So thank you. Thank you, Victoria. I mean, let me give you a, a very simple example that was briefly touched upon earlier today, the issue of facial recognition. So facial recognition is what is an algorithm sifting through vast amounts of pictures of somebody to be able to recognize them in different settings. 
right? So you and I, we're lucky because we have an eye and a brain that works extremely well. So if you see a face, you can say that this is a man, this is a woman, this is somebody who's blonde, this is somebody who's got dark hair, this is somebody who's got gray hair, this is somebody who's got a beard, some mustache. You can realize that if you know people, you can know that if they put glasses or mustache or things, they will look different, but you still recognize them. An algorithm is by itself idiotic. It doesn't, it's not able to actually realize that. So you need to sift to give the algorithm huge amounts of different data so that the algorithm can find ways to recognize a face in a crowd or you know when you scan a passport and you and you, and you go through the gate, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now and that you know clearly has some extreme uh, or can have extreme privacy concerns. We're seeing some uh, you know, developments are happening in some parts of the world that are frankly extremely concerning for mass control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, imagine the same technology uh, for good. And let me give you an example that that uh, one of our companies, and I will name them, Microsoft, has, has been doing. They've been working on a project to help visually impaired people uh, to be in a room and to be able to recognize things around them because they have you know, deficiencies in their eyesight. Um, same, same situation here. So if you, you, know, you and I know what a chair looks like, but if you think, if you look, take an IKEA catalog, for instance, there are a multitude of chairs. An algorithm is not able to know that you know, a chair can be red or blue or black or with uh, you know, armrest, no armrest, uh, uh, etc. So you need to be able to, to feed this into the machine to say, this is a chair, this is an orange, this is a banana, this is a pineapple, this is a picture from above, from the side, from all kinds of different components, and that ultimately the algorithm will be able to help the person that has visual impairment to be able to walk in a room and say, hey, hang on a second, there's a table here, a chair there, you should sit here and not there, because you know that, that could have repercussions. So same technology, different uses, different contexts. So the privacy considerations, because it's part of this panel discussion, will be radically different. So to your point, Victoria, we cannot have a one-size-fits-all for everything, and we need to always think about it, and that is where the difficulty lies, right? As lawmakers, policymakers, we all have, we want to find solutions, that's, and that's great, that's what we're also seeking to do, but let's try to make sure that we, that we always you know, take the right solutions for the right developments. Um, I will end on, 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 the, on the point you were mentioning about, you know, can privacy create, create some difficulties? Well. Not yet, but we are seeing one of the one of the files that, that we've been following for a long time is the e-privacy regulation. I won't bore you with the details, but e-privacy regulation is in the context of machine-to-machine -machine communication, uh, is focusing on the issue of consent. Now, consent you and I can give it, it's easy. And I wonder how a machine can actually give that uh, to another machine at the other end of the line. So unless we try ways to ensure that we create a balance that can work, you know, we may and I say we may, I don't say we will, we may have, we may, uh, you know, prevent some, some levels from happening. That's really interesting. Thank you. The creative tension that inevitably there, se there will be, it seems, between concerns to protect privacy um, against um, the desire to, to nurture um, innovation. If um, you were named, in fact, by John Langman, if I can pick on the Microsoft perspective, you were talking about going, you were talking in glowing terms about GDPR and the need to go, go beyond privacy, whether or not nonetheless you see that there could be a risk posed to innovation, particularly in this part of the world where we're painfully aware of, of lagging behind other parts. Thank you. I think Thomas took a great example with facial recognition. It's, uh, Microsoft is calling for more regulation around uh, facial recognition. It's, it's a good example because it's a, a concrete you know, application of AI development, uh, which is at the same time uh, uh, very exciting, but a bit scary as well. You know? I think you, you've all seen this video, in, uh, I think it was in Chinese airports, when you see people standing in front of a screen, and the screen only you know, reading and screening their face would be, was able to provide them with all information about their flights, you know? So people were impressed, but at the same time, it's scary, you know? <laughs> so that's why we need to improve trust in, in, in this way. And, and transparency, again, is, is really important. How can we explain how facial recognition works? How can we improve fairness as well? Uh, uh, you mentioned the, 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 the thing about the, the different faces that are analyzed, and we know that 
most of the data are about uh, white uh, men. And that's why some AI systems are struggling with women or dark-skinned people. And that's things we need to improve, obviously. Uh, around facial recognition, there are a lot of uh, development that need to be framed. And uh, let me give you another example with law, enforce law enforcement authorities. You can imagine how facial recognition can be useful for law enforcement authorities, for investigations, for surveillance. But we need to frame that, you know, uh, because in bad hands or in countries, non-democratic countries with no fundamental rights uh, guarantees and boundaries, it can be uh, it can have very bad consequences. So, for example, we need to maybe uh, impose court orders uh, to allow uh, law enforcement authorities to use such technologies, or only use these technologies when there is a imminent risk for death of death or, or serious injuries. That could be potential things that we could uh, think about. Uh, commercial development of facial recognition is also a concern. You know. How can you control and, and monitor the way uh, companies are commercializing uh, facial recognition services and products? And we can imagine like third, third party entities, neutral entities, independent uh, bodies testing, for example, uh, these services and products to make sure that they're not discriminatory, they're not taking biased decisions uh, through this, these technologies. So that's different way of exploring uh, this, and, and I'm sure that maybe facial recognition could be uh, something that Europe can, 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 can look at very carefully and, and, and maybe take the first steps to, uh, to, to create a, a framework uh, helping this technology to develop in, in a good way. Andre, do you have a perspective on that at Google? The, the complexity of getting the balance right. Um, you mentioned um, uh, you mentioned the kind of um, varying degree of concern that certain people may have with privacy vis-a-vis -vis, um, innovation. So if you could um, address that, that would be great. Yes, and, and, and I would maybe bundle it in, uh, in the topic of, of something that is often referred to as algorithmic transparency. <laughs> Uh, which again um, uh, is, is, a, is a very simple, very simple term. Uh, in the uh, in, in the guiding principles, how we think about this uh, this meaningful, meaningful and, and empowering user choice, there are a couple of uh, examples I will I would like to share with you. One is of course uh, making users aware and, and educate all of us uh, about how how certain technology works again in a meaningful way. So we have launched, for example, uh, a website called How Search Works, where you can look and you can kind of in depth uh, understand how, how, the factual, how the actual search works. But then uh, we may be sometimes in a need of kind of immediate uh, uh, reaction or immediate explanation why did I receive something and, and then the, the, the how to make it meaningful when uh, you are having a screen of this size, uh, that's, a, that's a question. And I think it's a fascinating research question. Uh, what we are, for example, doing is if you see an ad uh, these days, maybe you have noticed that there, there has been added a, um, a, a, a small, um, uh, you know, why I'm seeing this ad. It's not disturbing you, but it allows you to, okay, if I question why, why do I see this, I can click and I can find a meaningful explanation, or at least we are striving to make it meaningful. So you are seeing this ad because of this, this, this. Do you agree? If not, here is what you can do. Change your privacy settings. So, so that is another example. Uh, we are, uh, um, and, and some of you, if, if you are um, experiencing and, and from time to time choose to use our products and services, we are experimenting and we are investing a lot uh, um, uh, in the privacy checkups, for example, or my account, being aware of, of the data that is being collected, how it is used, and, and, and choosing your, your comfort level of comfort is, is uh, again, very, very important. And one last uh, point I will mention, which is a fascinating um, area of research, both with our researchers, but I know, you know researchers from other institutions are, are looking at that, and that is the, the so-called data sheets. Uh, imagine we speak about a lot of data. Uh, the, 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 the truth is what we hear uh, from our engineering colleagues is that we are moving to a stage where it's not about the quantity of data, but about the, the, the data sets, 
how the data is well properly structured, labeled. Um, it's very difficult to imagine uh, a small company or a startup uh, kind of chunking through a, a huge amount of data. So we are trying to address that by these data sheets. And, and imagine if you buy a, a shirt, at the bottom you have a sheet, and that says a small label, and that says this is the purpose, this is how you should wash it. Uh, you shouldn't wash it in a very, very hot water because then it may, you may not be satisfied as a consumer. So there is a certain level of information. And so the researchers are looking at, can we provide similar level of information about the data sets or for that sake also for the algorithms? So imagine that you have a data set and you as a company choose to use the data set, but you will have a sheet attached to it, data sheet, which will tell you, okay, this set of data is great if for most of the very simple industrial application, but it is probably not good to be used in the healthcare sector. And we find that, very, that, that meaningful transparency with what is the purpose of, EP, of the data uh, to be useful. And the same is also with the, with the algorithms. Algorithms, basically long, complicated mathematical formulas. Uh, some of those are, well, all are robust, but some of those are okay to be used for, uh, you know, uh, for kind of non-life-threatening situations. And yes, we all would, would say if the question is about can I use this algorithm for a nuclear power plant or for a research on cancer or giving a medical advice, we all sense, and we agree as well, that there may be a, a, a kind of more rigid uh, review process. So uh, meaningful transparency in that sense is, for example, the idea of, of sheets, data sheets, which basically enable you to understand a little bit more what is it that you are expected, what is kind of predictable use of the data set or of the algorithms, and then if you decide, and, and then allow you to make a choice, where, where do you want to apply that um, data set in your use? So that may be some of the ideas around uh, how we are looking at this, how to make the AI and machine learning, in our case, uh, meaningful and more, more explainable, both for the consumers, but also for the companies. It's great, André, that you acknowledge the concerns, the challenges facing smaller businesses and the going into a bit more de detail on the um, meaningful transparency. Niels, I saw you nodding when um, André was talking about data sheets, so um, over to you there. And I'd also be interested in knowing um, your views on how well you think business is communicating around the challenge of privacy and AI. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks. I'm, I'm very glad to see that, that all the, the companies here in the panel are, are contributing. Uh, no, no, really, I mean that because I mean that there are other data-driven companies which did not really care about privacy and concerns, and, and now we see the backlash on the whole, um, the whole digital industry. Um, and if you come up now and say, oh, GDPR is so great, no one trusts you anymore. So we have to act from the beginning, and um, really, I mean, one one bad example um, is the negative impact to, to all of us here. So I think we should uh, put together all the things we do research on, and we do in uh, the high-level expert, group, for example, as well. And I mentioned that in the beginning, uh, what we are doing, we start from the beginning of the development of the AI system, and uh, we provide help to our software developers with the everyday ethics guidelines, which is a very a clear, explained um, way of, of uh, commuting, communicating our principles I mentioned to our software designers and, and engineers. Um, we have also open source tools, our AI Fairness 360 toolbox, where the open source community and everyone who, who is able uh, to do that in a technical uh, sense can analyze the data sets, detect bias, mitigate bias, and develop these tools as their open source further. Um, and we also think about fact sheets, and that, that was why I was nodding uh, my head, um, but our fact sheets are more attached to the AI system itself, and explain in a clear and understandable uh, way for the user, um, which data is in there, how was it trained, how is the algorithm working, um, and what has been done to, to mitigate and detect um, bias. So uh, there are a lot of um, interesting uh, ways to, to gain trust, and I think we should think put them all together to, to reach that, that main um, goal. Um, talking about communication, I think we are, we are on a good way, not only here on the panel, uh, 
but also in terms of uh, what we do with, with policymakers, um, with the high level act expert group on AI, the uh, ethics guidelines which will be published by the Commission on the 9th um, of April, um, which contain clear recommendations and um, also um, checklists for, um, for companies who would like to develop AI further. Um, and um, I think we should <coughs> yeah, focus on uh, doing that on a European level uh, to coordinate more member states. Um, I know that there is the European data space plan, but that is still a little bit vague, I would say. Um, and to reach out also to, to other uh, countries. Um, I've heard that um, Canada and Singapore um, will, will join the uh, next phase of the, uh, of the AI ethics um, guidelines which will be issued. So that is a very interesting uh, approach where, where you are clearly leads um, and companies should contribute also in terms of communications. Thank you very much for that um, broadening perspective. It's a great um, moment to cross to Gordon, in fact. Um, I know you do work with um, governments around the world. We heard in an earlier panel about the, the Society of Trust, um, particularly in Norway. It would be good to know um, from your perspective what you're seeing in terms of the rest of the world. This is a bit broad, but um, the various challenges, any um, concrete good examples, concrete bad examples that you are seeing in your work. But as they touch on governments plus business, then. Well, I'd love to do it in two minutes. No, you can have more than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think I think first thing is um, to recognise, and maybe so, that the EU, the, EU, the, uh, the uh, ministers that started the conversation this morning, I think the EU's been perhaps a little bit hard itself, so somewhat behind. I mean, the EU kind of claimed to be the leader in investment and use of AI compared to other parts of the world, but certainly. Um, US and China in business consumer. But the um, EU has very much opportunity to kind of lead business to business, public to citizens um, engagement. Um, and again, it's very difficult to compare different countries and different areas of the world because each market has, and sector has different sensitivities, both in terms of AI uptake and safeguarding, but also different, different parts of the world think differently about privacy and ethics. So it's you know, it, it, it is difficult to take a one, a one view across the world. Um, what I must say is, um, about the EU, EU approach and high-level expert group is it it's, should be commended for its transparency, its like leadership, its openness, and um, the uh, direction it's taking. I kind of recognise across the world that there's a real inevitable tension between speed and process. So the issue is that we need to release these guidance, release guidelines, look at standards, look at regulation, do it very quickly. But every country across the world is racing to lead. Everybody wants to be first. Everybody wants an AI, an AI leadership. Everybody wants to, <coughs> to be leading this great new um, promise. So this has an effect of even companies like Splunk, who are relatively large, trying to track all this, trying to work out what's happening, trying to direct our resources, our help, our technical experts, the right, right countries and the right um, focus is most difficult. That's probably very difficult for, for small organisations. So rather than sort of bad practice, point out bad practice, a few, a few points to kind of perhaps raise. Um, they kind of feel that maybe we need some form of coordinated approach to avoid overlap and discrepancies, you know, use the best European expertise in the right places, and perhaps EU has an opportunity to create some form of umbrella to coordinate all this effort to make sure people are aware of what's going on and companies like ourselves can help in the right place. They also need to be careful that AI is, is very new, it's very exciting, but some of the issues around it aren't very new. We've, we've been doing big data analytics for some time. So we need to put effort into data privacy, ethics, explainability, etc. But we need to make sure we don't invent new regulation, new standards, new requirements. Um, and perhaps we've addressed these things previously. I suppose the other point also is, is globally is to be careful not to take a one-size-fits-all fit, approach. Thomas said this earlier. Not all AI, not all digital technology impacts human beings. A, an algorithm that's assigning um, database table resources to a manufacturing service line may not affect any human beings. It may not need to be looked at to the same extent as an AI algorithm that's assigning um, mortgage applications to a human being. So again, we need to make sure we're, we, are, we are factoring things and move forward. 
I suppose the final point is Europe needs what we need to do is is work globally with global institutions. And one of the ones why I'm involved in is the World Economic Forum. Um, and really why do I think that's good, not just because I'm I'm, I'm working on it, but mainly because um, the World Economic Forum is is convening we're looking at how to unlock public sector um, procurement for AI. And um, what you'll see in the next few weeks is they'll they'll release um, principle based uh, guidance for procurement officials and um, a workbook for procurement people. And why is this a good example? Because one, it's, it's global, you know, it's a big organisation like the EU, but it's also it's, 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 crazy, it's changing the way we think about ethics, and privacy, transparency through creating opportunities for companies to deliver technology, transformation technology to the public sector. So by using, if you follow these principles and change the way we contract, organisations will have to deliver the technology according to privacy, transparency, explainability, verification. So my point is, if we create opportunities, then the industry will follow. Thank you. You did cover a lot of ground very efficiently there, particularly, no, that particularly covering um, the challenge of as we as we race to be first, nonetheless having to contend with um, legitimate privacy concerns. And also, while Europe is racing to be first, it still needs to work um, internationally and globally. So there's a bit of a balancing act there. Before um, crossing for a few questions from the floor and then wrapping up, I'm going to ask um, each of our panelists um, in a couple of, in a, a sentence really, to, um, Name one solution um, that would address privacy concerns that we are seeing here in Europe around AI, um, and yet nonetheless not stifle innovation. Uh, and that can be an ask from um, the public sector, uh, European institutions, or collective ac action across European business. Um, but just, you know, top of mind, what do you think needs to be done, starting from the end on the day? Privacy, from its uh, definition, is a very personal matter, and we should be focusing on enabling users to make a choice. One of those examples is uh, in for us industry working with governments on the idea of data sheets, explaining uh, what is the data useful used uh, for, and uh, allowing companies or users to make a choice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, briefly, um, I think Europe is uh, leading the regulation worldwide on, on technologies and AI developments. And in particular, again, coming again on, on facial recognition, maybe this is a good opportunity for Europe to look at it, not only on the privacy perspective, but on all the other perspectives we, 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 we uh, mentioned. Today. Thank you. Gordon, what would you say? Um, I think we can all do, do some work, industry, government, institutions, to define what we mean by AI, what actually it is, <laughs> um, and ensure that our systems understand the terms we understand and perhaps allay some of the fear and misinformation. So, communication and education. Um, Niels? Yeah, we, we have a very high privacy standard with the GDPR here. Europe in place, we would like to see even more harmonization within GDPR. We see there are a lot of open questions, a lot of opening clauses, uh, diverging guidelines from regulators. And I would like to see to, to wait how what GDPR covers before we come uh, with the e-privacy um, regulation around the corner, which covers everything from machine data to private data to individuals to um, companies. So um, this is a little bit what I would also. Very concrete response. Tom, what would you say? Uh, you know, you asked us for one thing, and as I said before, we can't see things with one size fits all. So I think I'm going to give you a few things that I think are, are, are critical and necessary. I think uh, looking at, at uh, you know, uh, as Nis was mentioning, you know, the GDPR adoption, how it works in practice for, 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 for artificial intelligence, how do you look at that in the, in the in the prism of context and purpose. I think this is, if there's one thing that you should remember from me today in this room is context purpose. Purpose, context, context, purpose. That's really the critical thing that, that, that we should think about. Um, 
One of the things that I would like to mention, uh, and that's you know, according to the great work that WEF is doing, uh, from what Gordon mentioned a second ago, the WEF is thinking about the agile policy making. So agile is a way that you develop software where the engineers start thinking about how you want to achieve something, and then you start building. And then along the way, you realize, ah, this is not working, this is not working. And so you move along in order to achieve your objective. Uh, policy making in Brussels, you know, is pretty straightforward as a standard line. You start from a proposal, and at the end of the day, you end up with a proposal that's slightly amended. It's not radically different. Um, and in the time, the average time legislation happens in, in this town, and I'm not talking about the implementation of the state level, let's say usually 18 months, two years for legislation, the number, the volume of data in the world has more than doubled. Okay? So when you're thinking about AI policies or, or, or policy around data, maybe having a more agile policy making, decision making process would be helpful because we can shift along the way according to developments, things that happen, and not be bound by this really rigid uh, uh, construct that, that we have now. I think that would be music to business ears, really. <laughs> I want to ask the um, panel whether or not we have time to take a couple of questions before the, from the floor before um, I ask Tom to wrap up for me. Is that? Okay, thank you. Any um, questions from the floor? Yes. Okay, hi, my name is Daniel. I come from the healthcare sector. Um, um, I come from the healthcare sector, uh, where we've seen um, tremendous potential of AI, especially medical imaging, gen genetic analysis, and also towards personalized medicine. Um, I didn't hear anyone talk about that. Um, of course, we are very aware of the, the issues as well in the healthcare sector, because that's where privacy is actually the strongest, and we do need trust, but we do see the potential. And currently working on the research which can use neural networks to classify cancer images, and we see that can help. Um, so I wanted to get your opinion on this. Anyone in particular? Uh, anyone can take a question, actually. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would go forward, of course, we have with our Watson Oncology products, a wide range of, of um, AI and, and healthcare-related products. And this is really a challenge because healthcare is, is clearly uh, one of the, the most complicated but also most promising uh, sectors to, to mm -hmm. apply AI on. And we had um, access, clearly. But we also have very good uh, examples, for instance, in the um, oncology area where, where we see key benefits if a doctor works together uh, with an AI system and both capabilities add up to a better result. Um, when it comes to, to privacy implications, um, clearly we have to, to see how that will be um, interpreted by the regula regulators here in, in Europe with the GDPR, this is still a new field, um, how that is implemented um, on member state basis. This is what I meant by we need more harmonization because there are diverging rules. Um, and that's clearly uh, not, not easy, but I think it's doable even in Europe, but you might have uh, other regions of the world um, with a other legal framework and maybe a competitive um, advantage for, for other companies who decide to develop in these regions. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to, uh, well, maybe a couple of people could answer this here. Uh, we, we need, a, I mean, we all agree that we, we need a level playing field. Uh, we all agree that there are lots of initiatives. I mean, you know, what, what uh, a couple of people said here resonates very well with, the, uh, with what I was explaining also on the high level group. So it's, it's all very much fine, but we know that there are uh, countries that have maybe uh, different uh, cultures, etc. So how do how do we reach this level playing field, and what can global companies, big global companies that are represented here, do to help? Anyone game for this one? <clears throat> I think we can talk in the industry at large. What we can help with um, the conversation being two ways. Quite often, the industry very good at receiving information from institutions and governments. So perhaps we should, as um, <coughs> companies developing and working on AI, um, working with bodies such as World Economic Forum and um, other bodies across the world, to ensure that we are, the communications coming back to you in the EU, you know, we are coordinating, we are informing, we are cooperating. So 
about CSLs not just as a supplier or the consumer, but also as a as a partner. But but don't wait for the partnership to be developed ourselves. Let's just make sure we are we communicating more effectively. Thank you, and I think Andre, you have something to say. On the level playing field, uh, question two, maybe two points. The first one is that um, I think part of the discussion in Europe and globally about level playing field is also what do we do, how do we review existing regulation and fitness of that regulation for other sectors. I think a lot of has been said in that sense about telcos and other, other more traditional uh, industries, and I think that is an important part of the debate. Second point. Uh, what we can do, um, uh, if, if you um, search online with the search engine of your choice, um, Open Data Day, um, you will find out that we have released a, a large, uh, we have released a couple of data sets, which are well, cu well curated in the proper structure, labeling, etc. And, and I think this is a contribution that is a meaningful for both governments and companies. So kind of releasing an endless amount or speaking about endless amounts of data will not achieve what, what we have, what is the philosophy, what we have in mind. Rather, having this agile data set where you can choose, but somebody has curated the data set for you, and you, be it government or a small enterprise or a big enterprise, you can benefit from that. Uh, that is, I think, uh, our contribution to, to the level playing field, as you would uh, call it in your question. Thank you. Um, there are two quick final questions which will receive two, uh, some succinct answers. So the gentleman here and then there's a, a woman at the back and that's, I'm afraid, we're well over time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think Gordon touched on the question, uh, on my question, which is about um, how we have a tendency to anthropomorphize AI, give it human agency, make it think, make us believe that somehow uh, it's behaving like a human. And therefore, we tend to start having what I think false debates about ethics and so on. Um, would the panel, and maybe uh, this is something for, for Thomas, given that you represent the industry most broadly here, um, and you mentioned your, uh, your guidelines, um, is there a danger that we start obsessing about ethics of AI rather than ethics of organizations in how they use AI, and that the proper emphasis ought to be on the organizations and corporate ethics rather than um, some fanciful idea about um, um, AI itself having agency. I mean, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think at the end of the day, you know, ethics, uh, it, it's, it's, so AI, it, so AI in itself is, is what? It's an algorithm and data sets. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want with it. You can do it for good, you can do it for bad. Uh, with the same exact technology, the same data sets, you could do tremendously great things and you can do tremendously bad things. So ultimately, and that's why you know, the ethical, ethical guidelines that we all have developed, the Commission has worked extensively on with the high-level expert group, tend to do the same thing. How do you create parameters around you know, the, the, the uses, and, and how, do you, how do you create in the mindset of you know, engineers, uh, you know, company reps, uh, uh, you know, lawmakers, the, this idea of how do, you, how do you let all the, I mean, ethics is not one single thing. You know, Carl, Carl was mentioning it, it's been there for like 3,000 years. We're just now applying to technology that is evolving extremely rapidly. Um, so, so, you know, and, and so, you know, I will sound like a broken record, and people who know me well know that that's what I do best. I'm a broken record, I say the same thing over and over again. You know, it's, it's the same thing, it's context and purpose. Let's look at it in every single step of the way, because this is the only way that we can have meaningful, uh, you know, protection and ensuring that, that it achieves purposes that we set it for, in ways that are you know protected and that 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 uh, are uh, you know acceptable to uh, to us as uh, as humans and individuals. Thank you, Thank you, Toma. Our very last question, and then we'll release our panelists back to their day jobs. Um, I will follow up on the subject that the gentleman in France actually uh, uh, mentioned about the level playing field because I've read an article about creating a multilateral system like the WTO we have trade for privacy and uh, AI. And I was wondering what are your thoughts on it? Is it something that is doable? Should we push for it or not? Who would like to take that? Is this up oh, yes. Uh, Gordon, is that this something that would be up your alley? Thank you. It's not. It's not one I'm, I'm familiar with, etc. So to be honest with that. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds immensely um, uh, ambitious. Um, 
But you know, all, going back to what I said about global organisations, I mean, if, if the WTO convene, convening power, um, that's possible. I think anything that, that operates at that kind of level, again, going back to, and I'm, I'm, I'm broken record as well, you know, we need to make sure that it's proportional, <laughs> appropriate, that it's not a one size fit, fits all, and we take um, a global view on how privacy and ethics are thought about across the world. Maybe if I add one, one thought, um, I feel that in different regions of the world we have um, new privacy uh, frameworks evolving based on GDPR or with other, um, with other examples, uh, with strong data localization um, instruments, um, and, and we see a global fragmentation. Um, what I would think is, is necessary also in the context of AI and, and data flows is interoperability. So independent of the system, which is a certain region in place, there was somehow a way to, to yeah, exchange data and to, to make it compatible um, among the different systems. Thank you, um, Neil. Tom, I think you have um, something to add as well. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to add, I think, you know, the, so privacy and AI is a very you know, important issue. I think ultimately, Nils is right, you know, we're seeing a lot of, 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 of privacy legislation all around the world. I mean, our organization, you know, our members are, are working you know, in India, in Japan, in Singapore, in Latin America. Uh, obviously, we spend a lot of time in, in Europe on this. And we're seeing a lot of, of interest in, you know, for countries to either upgrade their laws uh, or create new laws. Um, and ultimately, you know, we, we, need, we need to have a convergence of these norms. And then the convergence, the reason why we need that is pretty simple. Uh, Nils mentioned data localization requirements that are popping left, right, and center, which are totally unhelpful in the context of cloud computing, artificial intelligence. You know, we are, uh, our companies are global companies, operate all around the world, and the efficiencies, the gains that you, that you, that you have from cloud AI is all about this data being able to be at any given place, at any given moment, with, that, with the least friction possible. If you create a reg reg regulatory regime around privacy that recognizes, and privacy is also a very cultural thing, the way that you want you see privacy you know, will be different here than it's be, it will be in Latin America or it will be in Southeast Asia. Uh, culturally, not, not meaning that the goals are not the same, but the way to address that are very different. So convergence of the systems to ensure that data can flow around the world while being protected and ensuring that we ultimately, as users, individuals, consumers, citizens, benefit from that is critically important. Is the WTO or a WTO-like model the right approach? I don't know, but at least it's worth exploring. I think the more we can think about these things and how do we ensure this, you know, Niels call it interoperability, I call it convergence. It's, you know, two different words that have the same or, or similar meaning. How do we do that? Yes, I think we should continue thinking about this. It's hard because this is, this is absolutely critical. Great to um, thank you, Tom, and end on this very forward-looking aspirational note. I'd like to thank all our um, panelists and just hand back to Tom briefly to um, make some con concluding remarks on the overall um, AI Made in Europe um, seminar. Um, unfortunately, our MP can't be with us, so over to you, Tom, and thank you from my point of view. Thank you, Victoria. I know, so I know to be broken record right again, otherwise people are going to start leaving the room when I speak, which is not, not the greatest thing. No, but I think, you know, the, the, looking at this entire morning discussion, I think there's, every, like, you know, it probably was boring for you guys in the room because we all agree. I think we all agree on the objectives. We all agree that, that you know, we, we need to think about this hard. We need to move forward. Um, at, at the same time, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, 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 to think about this. Let me take the example of this, of the guidelines. Well, we all have our own guidelines, the Commission has no guidelines. They all, if you look at them, and you, you probably read them on Monday with, with a strong interest, we say, just like we talked a minute ago about the privacy thing, we speak the same language, we just use different words. And I think you know, may, being able to converge all of this in ways that we can all continue to, you know, protecting privacy, develop new solutions that would be helpful to companies, government, businesses, uh, and, uh, and individuals are, are, are things that uh, that, that we should strive for. Um, I think there was a recognition today that, that you know, the differentiated approach, like no, no one size fits all, is important. There's, you know, we need to look at things horizontally well, and we also need to look at things vertically where we can. Um, but ultimately, I think this, this discussion you know, is you know, not even halfway through because you know, we started it a long time ago and it will continue over the years. And I think, you know, and, and, and Carla and, and Eric was mentioning that earlier, you know, the next commission takes 
uh, uh, or the next College of Commissioners will take there. Uh, the the post in, in, in November, I'm sure that AI will be a really strong uh, uh, component of the next strategy of the European Commission, will be a strong focus of the European Parliament, is a strong focus of member states. And I think we'll see more and more of these discussions uh, uh, in, in years to come. And I think the things that we will have to think about is AI touches upon every single sector of human activity, not economy, activity. Everything from healthcare to cybersecurity to inclusion to education to uh, you know uh, the ability. You know, let, let me close with one example to give you an idea of how AI is used so in so many different ways. One of our companies is Helsing Carlsberg, the beer manufacturer in, in in Denmark, to create new flavors of beer using artificial intelligence. Now, you know, who would have thought that this was actually something that 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 was even possible existed? So the more we're cognizant of AI is not one thing. AI is not static. Uh, you know, the more that you try to aim and strive at the, at the same goals you know, and, and to golden points, talking, you know, government, industry, civil society, everyone, academics, working together to, to, to move things forward, I think we can, in Europe, be uh, a strong leader in, uh, in, in years to come. So I'm, I'm very hopeful, and I hope you are hopeful, and we're all hopeful for this sort of happen. Thank you.